So hello again. Uh, the joy of having multiple talks in a row is that hopefully I can skip most of this introduction this time. And uh, I can skip to uh, how um, collaborative editing is done in LibreOffice Online using LibreOffice Kit. LibreOffice Kit is just an API to be used by programmers, um, but the end result uh, can be visible in the LibreOffice Online, uh, LibreOffice Android port, and the, the app that's uh, available in the, from the Play Store that's, that is using LibreOffice Kit. Also, LibreOffice Online uses LibreOffice Kit. And uh, lately, um, all the features that has been added to the LibreOffice Kit API was for the um, LibreOffice Online purposes. Um, uh, first, um, I would like to show you a few results, how, how um, it works and how you see it as a user. And then uh, we will dive into the more technical detail. Uh, so just to recap, I think uh, what star rendering is was already explained at least two times in different talks. Um, but basically, um, these are just uh, these uh, 256 um, uh, pixel-sized um, uh, pixel buffers, these ties. Um, in this picture, um, do I have a laser pointer? Oh, sorry, so hopefully you can spot those uh, small rad uh, rectangles, that uh, those are drawn in this debug mode at the top left corner of each tile, so you can guess how large a tile is. Um, and if everything goes uh, correctly, then you don't see any artifacts at the tile join, so it's completely transparent. Um, as far as I uh, know, um, this was mainly invented uh, by the Mozilla Firefox Android stream and um, we took it over. Uh, and uh, now we still use the same tile uh, size for online, and I'm not sure if that's a good or a bad idea, but uh, that's how it is. So first there was this tile rendering. And then uh, last year there was a project ending in May uh, for tile editing, or as we call them, um, the Android editing. Um, the idea is that once we are able to render parts of the document to these tile buffers and then have some custom platform-specific UI stitching them together and presenting you a document, um, wouldn't it be nice if you could actually modify the document? Um, that um, needed um, um, a way in the API so that uh, uh, you can transfer uh, touch events or mouse events and keyboard uh, events and so on. And also the other direction so that when some part of the document is changed then the client can re-render the changed part. Also uh, native selections were added so you, uh, on Android you can long push on a word and you get this selection with a selection handle that's uh, quite family, hopefully familiar from other applications um, and so on. So this is tied rendering and tied editing. This is already done. But the, this talk is about collaborative editing, where it's, it's just editing, except that you have multiple users editing at the same time. So you get to get conflict. And the question is how, how to do conflict handling. Um, in, uh, in this um, API, uh, we dis decided to go for an optimistic approach. So we do our best effort uh, conflict resolution, and then uh, the um, uh, result is presented to the users immediately. In case uh, the result is not sus satisfying, then the user can quickly and easily uh, change the result. Uh, one example here that you can see on the uh, screen is um, two users. Uh, on the left, the user uh, select the word document. And on the right, the cursor is in the document world. Um, so in case the uh, left user would decide to delete the word, then we just move the cursor out from the word and then do the deletion. And in case this is not, not what they wanted, they immediately see the result. And they can press undo or something. Um, once 
Um, this, this is the, 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 the most major problem to, to, to handle when there are multiple inputs and they are conflicting and something has to be done. Um, once this is working, um, then um, if you ever saw collaborative editing in, for example, Google Docs, you saw that there are these uh, collaborative uh, text cursors um, where you have your own black blinking cursor, but you still see where the others are. And um, um, we implemented um, the same uh, in this API, and then it's visible in LibreOffice Online as well. Um, so we have um, the, these um, collaborative cursors, or as, I, as we call it in the API, the view cursors are not blinking, they are colored, and um, they have um, visibility, so possibly they are not visible because a shape was, for example, selected, and then the text cursor is not visible. They have a position on the side. Um, these uh, collaborative text cursors are used for writer text. They are used for edit engine text that includes the CAC uh, cell text and also shape text in, in any application. Um, then um, um, basically the very same overlay uh, uh, that's used for normal cursors can be used for these collaborative cursors as well. Um, these uh, screenshots are from a text tool uh, called GTK Tag Viewer. Um, I will uh, mention it at the end of the talk how we do testing. Um, but the point here is that um, um, all these screenshots are from the test tool. So uh, it's not exactly how it looks in the browser. In the browser, you also have these cursors have, ha have hats. And you can see the name of the user at the top of the cursor. And if they don't move for a long time, then they are um, automatically hidden and so on. Once uh, text cursors are um, handled, we can uh, uh, think about um, collaborative text selections. Um, um, that means that, um, um, it basically means, means two things. Uh, one thing is that um, you have this selection rectangle and um, again, your one is, is some fixed color you can recognize, like uh, blue or something. And, um, and, that, uh, and everyone else selection um, has the matching cursor to the, to, the no, uh, to the collaborative text cursor, so you can easily match them. Um, and also, um, again, there are some names of, uh, on top of the selection and so on. <coughs> For, um, for editing the shape text, um, only one user can edit the text of a shape at the same time. So what we do is that uh, this is an um, impress uh, example document, what you can see here. Um, most of the, the picture is from the left side. We are editing there. And on the right side, you can the, the small picture shows a small lock icon. So we signal the other uh, views that this shape tax is being edited. And if they click there, then the editing won't start. And they will understand why uh, the editing doesn't start. Um, one thing that uh, was implemented in core to help this situation is that uh, by default, um, when you started um, editing, the shape tax and the other views disappeared. Um, if you ever dived into um, uh, this um, uh, shape text rendering, then you know that there are different code passes for, uh, for the viewing the shape text that's uh, handled uh, with the drawing layer primitives. And when you are editing, that's handled directly in the edit engine. So the problem here was that when you start editing, then um, we switch to this edit engine based um, rendering, and that only paints in the current view. Um, so I ex extended this uh, to so that as you type in the shape, um, shape text, um, as, the, as your own view is updated, every other view is updated. The, and there would have been nothing LibreOffice kit specific about this code. The only problem is that um, no other views also get the blinking cursor. And that's really confusing because you get the cursor, but if you click there, then nothing happens. And um, you, you, you guess that you could edit the shape text, but editing is still limited to a single view. So at the moment, I made it uh, conditional 
for the case when, when the LibreOffice code is running um, uh, in headless mode uh, using this LibreOffice kit um, API. So at the moment, you, you still see the old um, behavior on the desktop. Um, once uh, we have the um, um, text editing and shape text editing sorted out with the selections and the cursors, we can move on to uh, graphic selection. Um, but you can see here, again, uh, the, the normal graphic selection that was there already since the um, Android editing was implemented. And the other views get notified, and the other views get these colored versions of the very same selection. So um, once um, the text cursor and the selection is orange, then the uh, graphical selection will be orange as well. Luckily, unlike um, many other cases, um, these, um, these handles are implemented in a single place. Um, and um, um, there are no duplicate implementations in the code base. So um, this is um, uh, behaving uh, consistently in every application. Um, so that covers text cursors, selections, uh, text selections, graphic cursors. Uh, the next thing is uh, calc specific, uh, the cell cursors. Um, because it's, it's, you are not yet editing tags because you didn't start uh, cell text editing, but you are not selecting a shape either. So that's a specific uh, cell cursor. Um, it's again the, the very same. Um, on the left, you can see the, the upper cursor is your own cursor. It's a, it's a black rectangle or a black frame. And the lower one is a blue. That's a, a view um, or a collaborative cell cursor. Um, and on the right, you can see that the collaborative cursor is orange and the lower one is black. Um, so whenever uh, you are not selecting a shape in a calc or you are not editing a cell attack, then uh, you can see where the, this cell cursor is. So that's, uh, that's about the, the cursors and selections and, and uh, collaborative feedback like this. Um, the next problem is that um, in case uh, you edit a longer document and uh, independent part of the document are edited, then um, it can be uh, it can happen very easily that uh, you type um, in your area and somebody else types in another area and something unexpected happens. Like um, I don't know the other user accidentally selects the whole text and deletes it, and you don't understand what happened. So uh, for that, uh, we came up with a document repair um, um, dialog, which is basically just um, listing the undo redo stack that we have on the desktop as well. The only extension is that uh, I annotated the creation, the, the, um, these undo objects on the undo stack um, with the creator ID or the view ID. So in case um, um, there are two views, two users editing, and a word is deleted, then, uh, then later um, we can find out who was the user who deleted this. Um, presenting this in, in, a, in a table um, hopefully uh, helps the user to understand what happened. Um, and as good, uh, as good or bad the uh, undo redo implementation is, you can go back and forth in time. Um, and uh, see how the look document looked like um, before or after some other thing. Uh, this complements the feature of, um, for example, with the own cloud integration in LibreOffice Online, you also get versioning. Um, and in different situations, the different versioning or, or different time machine like uh, uh, feature can help you uh, the more. Um, another related um, feature is that um, next to just um, being able to undo and redo, um, we also have um, on the, even on the desktop version the change tracking, um, which works together like um, you can reject a change and undo the rejection and so on. So um, the LibreOffice Kit API also exposes these track, track changes. This is currently implemented on, only for writer. Um, but um, um, clients can um, um, already um, work with this API, and when the car part will be ready, then that will be completely transparent. Um, 
Uh, one challenge there is that uh, the LibreOffice expects that the username is part of the user profile, so um, the username rarely changes. Uh, on the other hand, with the collaborative editing, um, uh, multiple users are constantly typing, and the current username is constantly changing. So instead of um, uh, hard coding the, this uh, change username all the time in the configuration manager, no um, a writer can uh, store the uh, username uh, uh, in the in the view that uh, that belongs to the editing user, and in case there is a, um, a user or author name set there, then it will use that and not query the, the configuration. Um, and based on that, um, you can again came up with with a table where you can see the these redlining items with the correct author names and descriptions and so on. Um, it's a bit confusing. There is a, a, a track change can have a command and a description as well, and they are not the, the same. A command is uh, empty by default, and you can manually add some command there. The description is something auto-generated based on what you did, like uh, inserting or deleting some text. Um, so that's, that's pretty much uh, what uh, you can see as a user, and as long as it works, then you are happy and we can go home. Uh, but in case uh, something doesn't work as expected, that we are interested in how this is implemented. And um, the main trick is basically each user um, from, uh, of the API, um, or each editing user is mapped to the feature of uh, multiple windows on the desktop. Um, that's how we can uh, get lots of conflict resolution uh, for free, like um, the example I mentioned with the cursor being in the word and the um, other window deleting um, that very same word. Um, uh, although um, there are, this is not a um, too, too frequently used feature, so there are a number of corner cases where something strange happens when you have multiple windows because most of the time users have only a single window. So for example, in some situation, it was enough to just type some new text to the document and undo it, and only one view was repainted and, and you know, a box like this. Um, the good news is that in Writer and Impress, uh, the windows are, are mostly independent, so um, they can they already work uh, mostly the way we want for the collaborative editing purposes. In right term, you can easily type in parallel in multiple windows, and so on. Um, in Kog, the situation is more complicated. You can't really type in parallel in two, two cells, for example. Um, so that means that um, at an API level, uh, we have this log document class, and that has a number of um, new methods. Uh, the most important being this set view that's called before any other methods, so that in case two, um, two users are typing in parallel, that means the, the um, uh, LibreOffice WebSocket daemon that um, I should will be present, presenting later, um, uh, sets the view to one window and then posts the um, um, keyboard event in processes uh, uh, synchronously, and once it's uh, finished, it can uh, release the lock, and then the second user can get the lock, set the view to the window it wanted, it can process their uh, mouse event or keyboard event, and so on. Um, this way, um, in case somebody is not interested in collaborative editing, like the Android client, um, it doesn't have to do anything. It's, um, it's backwards comp compatible. You just don't use any of these view um, functions. So the create view is basically equivalent to this window, new window feature on the desktop UI. Um, you can close the view, you can set which one is the active, you can get um, an identifier for the view, which is just a, a serially incremented um, integer. Uh, you can uh, get the number of views and, and so on. Um, one, um, Problematic part uh, previously was that in case LibreOffice Core wanted to, to notify the client um, um, in, uh, same about something like uh, you type the character and you need to repaint part of the uh, uh, part of the document, so you need to paint new tiles. 
then this callback was uh, assuming that there is only one view. So that the callback sometimes was fired from the do model, the document model, sometimes from the view, and it didn't matter because there was only one view all the time. Um, now this is changed to be a view callback. That means that in most of the cases, the view is that uh, fired the callback. So for example, you type a key, and um, um, in the writer case, the, um, um, as the edit window, there are two edit windows for the two windows, and both of them get the invalidation, and then we fire the uh, LibreOffice kit invalidation even in both um, SW edit windows. And this way, we don't have to do any uh, multiplying of these um, events at the core level. There are a few cases where we still do this, like uh, in Impress, if you insert a new uh, slide, um, then uh, the easiest is to fire this event in the document model, but then we iterate over all the views so that everyone knows that there is a new slide. Um, again, uh, from, the, uh, from the client uh, point of view, you register the callback after setting the given view, so that in case you are not interested um, in, uh, in this model callback and view callback and, and so on, then you just do what uh, you did before. You just register the callback and you will get the same events what you got before. Um, as mentioned previously, um, um, one, one feature that uh, required quite some work uh, was to tag each and every and item uh, with these view IDs so that we know who did what when you uh, list the undo stack. Uh, that meant uh, there is some uh, common blaze casting writer, and there you can get uh, who is the what's the act, um, active window. It was the same. Uh, there was a similar base class in uh, Calc and Impress, and then uh, there is the, the the shared module for shape handling. Um, there you had to somehow access which one is the currently active window, and also um, uh, the same was needed in Edit Engine. Uh, the problem with edit engine is that it's a lower layer than, than all these. It's a, it's a lower layer than the SFX2, where all these view shell and object shell is, where you could query the ID um, of the view. So now there is an interface class in edit engine that um, describes just the things from the view shell that's needed for, the, for these purposes, and then the SFX view shell derives or implements this uh, interface. So that was a bit complex, uh, complex to first uh, came up with an idea how to invert this dependency. Uh, also, once we know who did what, uh, we could do uh, more, uh, more interesting um, uh, tricks with this information, like um, the undo manager is specific to the document, so that in case you are typing something here and something else there, and then the first view press the undo, then it will undo the changes of the second view, and that's quite confusing. That's um, expected if you have two windows on the desktop and you saw both windows in parallel, but with the collaborative editing, that's um, um, a bit unexpected. Um, so at least in writer, it already works that um, the collaborative editing case, um, the undo is limited, so that in case you are not owning the, um, the top of the undo stack, that you can't undo, so you can't accidentally undo the work of somebody else. But this is not uh, completely limited yet, so in other modules there are uh, cases when this limiting is not there. Uh, regarding the track changes, actually everything was there at the core level what we needed. Um, there is a generic um, uh, method called uh, get command values that uh, uh, gives you all the values uh, for, um, uh, for a given command that's valid. So this way you can get the different values, valid values for styles or font names. And uh, also the track changes, um, the initial list of uh, existing changes is queried this way. Um, then uh, as part of the initializing the view for uh, for title rendering, you can provide an author name, and this way, whenever you type here and there in multiple views, the red line and the inserted command is always created with the correct author name. Um, and then it's up to the uh, user of the um, interface to, to provide these names so that uh, 
uh, in case the WebSocket daemon talks the OnCloud, and uh, OnCloud is the ultimate, ultimate source of the username, and it uh, goes through all the various layers when at the moment, at the end, uh, core uh, knows what the correct username for that given view. And also there are various callbacks, uh, so that uh, once you have an initial list of existing red lines, um, you know, you get the updates and you don't have to query the full table again. So you get the insertions, modifications, and uh, removals from the table. So uh, basically what uh, remains is how we test all this. Um, all these features. Um, first, um, during development, I usually use the GTK Tide Viewer. That's an um, um, executable that's not part of the installation set, but if you build the code, then you can run it. Um, and um, th it's a very simple client that tries to still um, use all of the API so that I can interactively test if um, what I implemented is working correctly or not. Um, and most of the time it works correctly. That's how you could uh, see all those screenshots from GTK Tabular. And of course, uh, we also need automated testing so that uh, fixing new kernel cases don't break uh, older ones. Um, there are two layers. Um, there is a more high level in the desktop module that um, is basically using the API as it's exposed to the external clients. And um, there are uh, dedicated test suites in the writer, calc, and impress module where uh, we are loading the document uh, ourselves just uh, as for, for filter testing. And then um, uh, we can use the module internal API uh, for asserting what happened and, and, uh, or prepare and bringing the document to a state that's interesting from the point of testing. So um, today uh, we have almost 100 test cases, and um, there are um, many cases when it wasn't uh, needed to add a new test. A new test case for a given problem, it was just enough to extend it. So only 100 test cases, but uh, about uh, 400 asserts in, in, in the core side. Hopefully this way um, the the way the, um, the API is accessed from the outside is, is working as mostly as expected. And then the, um, the ones who work on the Android user interface or the web circuit, they can kind of focus on, on their work and not on the core box. At least that's the hope. So that basically concludes my talk. Thanks for listening.